Uh, okay, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to this November 2020 meeting of our uh, Edinburgh R users group. Uh, we had quite a, a few technical difficulties today with our meetup page not being accessible, uh, so probably some people will join in uh, as we go, but I'm, I'm very glad to, uh, to see so many people here and to welcome our two speakers. Uh, the first one will be Mike. Uh, Mike, as many of you know, is one of the co-organizers of these meetups, together with myself, Greg, and Karim. And uh, Mike is a data specialist at the Scottish Social Services Council now, and also provides independence data science consultancy. And today, he will talk to us about how data flows and how to use R to uh, to improve ETL. So, Mike, if uh, it's all right with you, I'll leave you the stage. Fantastic. Uh, right, let's have another go at sharing some screens. So, hopefully, you can see my screen. Yes, we can. Fantastic. Okay. Uh, and hopefully, now you have some very large slides, or at least they look yep, large yep, to yep. me. All good. Brilliant. Uh, okay, so yeah, thanks very much, Federico. Um, yeah, it's it's sort of new for me. I switched jobs about a month ago, um, but this is uh, what I'm going to speak about today is some consulting work uh, that I did over the summer, uh, and it's sort of this wider idea of how do we take our data from wherever our source point is uh, and get it ready for our analysis and visualization uh, within R. Um, so, what do I mean by by data flow? Um, well, I mean, sort of this idea of a data pipeline or um, this process of taking our raw data and, and ending up with our, our end output. So uh, we want to collect our data. Maybe that's in surveys. Maybe it's from instruments. Uh, we go through some kind of cleaning um, process. We, uh, we store it in some way, and that might just be transiently. Um, and we maybe do some analysis on it, or maybe we go straight to visualization, make some bar plots, some scatter plots, uh, all of those sorts of things. But we, um, but we want to think about this as, as all separate steps that we go through in order to get to our end point. Um, so uh, to skip on, this is uh, our, uh, the talk structure I'm going to go through today. Is the first half will be looking at a generic data workflow. Uh, and then the second half, we'll be looking at a case study, uh, which is uh, the consulting work I was doing um, for uh, the Global uh, Monitoring, Evaluation and Learning Partnership. Uh, and uh, I was helping out the comprehensive spending review uh, driven by Downing Street for the Conflict Security and Stability Fund, uh, which I'm likely to refer to as CSSF. Um, uh, there's obviously an elephant in the room here. While this is a, an, an R meetup, um, I think we will all, at uh, many points in, in our days and lives, um, bump up against spreadsheets and, in particular, Excel. Uh, they aren't going away as much as you know I might wish they might. Um, our clients, collaborators, whether that's internal or external, um, people expect them. They expect them for data entry. They expect them for results. Um, so. What we want to try and think about doing is is working with spreadsheets better, um, because at the moment, uh, often spreadsheets are used to do many different jobs. Uh, that we talk about having data in a spreadsheet, so it's busily being a data store. But we talk about doing our analysis or our graphs. All of those things happen, and maybe they all happen within the same spreadsheet. Uh, and this really, I think, hinders what we're uh, trying to achieve. Um, because if we can't change any part of our spreadsheet, it's very difficult to, to improve that. Um, so we want to think about that separate, uh, those separate five steps of, of our data workflow. Uh, and if we can try and tease those out from sort of this large hairball mass of a, of a single spreadsheet, it means that we can uh, isolate different points and say, well, actually, can we replace what's going on there? Um, can Instead of doing our data management in a spreadsheet, maybe our data has, uh, is running at a scale where we want to be storing that in some kind of spread, uh, some kind of a database. Uh, or maybe we want to switch our um, our analysis uh, from R to Python for some reason. Maybe we want to do our visualization uh, in uh, in D3, or maybe we want to switch to Power BI. Uh, maybe we want to change the way we're collecting data. Um, and if we've 
got all of these things as separate steps, it becomes far easier to choose the appropriate tools for the task we've got at hand. Uh, but if they are all muddled together and intertwined, it's very difficult to, to do that. Um, and the more, uh, the more we separate things out, the easier it becomes to reuse those tools. So maybe our data management solution, so actually it worked really well on that project, let's port it over to this new project because actually the data format and everything going on there is almost identical. So uh, we can you know, make an, an empty template copy, whatever, and we can, we can reuse that. Uh, and while these are all separate, it makes it much easier to automate the tasks, um, which uh, saves time and money and reduces human error. So particularly around the cleaning task, if we're um, pulling in lots of the same sorts of data, we'll be cleaning it in the same ways. And if we're having to do that manually, that's very tedious and uh, very likely to, to result in mistakes. Whereas um, we can automate that with tools like R and um, and have that run on a schedule and and so yeah it's far less time and far less likely for human error uh, so what about thinking our data about our data workflow in a in a slightly different way uh, so when we're collecting data uh, if it is human entered uh, rather than you know, sort of a machine output uh, it wants to be in a human readable format um, so the person that's entering the data the format they are entering it in needs to make sense to them uh, because that way it will be easiest for them to spot when they're making mistakes uh, if we give someone a form to fill in it's sort of a really obscure layout and they're jumping around to and it doesn't match the way that they're recording data and they're thinking of their data set then it, um, it becomes very difficult for them to enter data uh, but with the way we lay out our form, we always want this view of how do we get to a machine readable format uh, or in as easy a way as possible. So if we've always got our eye on that, that cleaning step of how are we going from human readable to machine readable, um, then that becomes far easier. Uh, and once we've got our data in a machine readable format, uh, it becomes much, much easier to do our analysis and our, um, our visualization. Uh, which ultimately is again human readable so we're talking summary tables or plots or graphics uh, the sort of thing that we can put in reports or on websites and engages with our audience uh, and helps sell uh, our analysis or our message <clears throat> so what do I mean by um, machine readable uh, and these slides are uh, from Julie Lowndes and Alison Horst uh, and um, yeah, Alison does some great drawings. She's the, the artist in residence at our studio. Uh, so um, it's sort of this idea of tidy data that Hadley Wickham coined. Uh, and I think we're all familiar with spreadsheets in the bottom format where, uh, you know, maybe we've got many tables Im embedded within one sheet or maybe we've got uh, multiple variables in a single column. Um, but actually, if we have our, uh, our data in a tidy format, uh, then we can reuse our tools really, really easily. Um, whereas if we have our data in an untidy format, then every single time we interact with our data or a new data set, it has to be a bespoke, a, a bespoke tool to get information out of that. Um, so thinking in advance how we're collecting our data will make those cleaning steps uh, far, far easier uh, and mean that we can uh, translate between our human readable format and our machine readable format in a, in a far easier and quicker manner. So what does this look like in practice? Um, so here I've, I've said, well, maybe we're using something like Microsoft Forms or I suppose it could be Google Forms or whatever else to collect our data. Uh, and maybe we're sending that out to collaborators and they're entering information in. Uh, then we're cleaning it in something maybe like R or Python. And this is effectively that ETL step, that extract, transform and, and load. We are then storing it. Maybe we're storing it in CSV if our, our file sizes are small or um, we're not too worried about people being able to edit it or controlling access. Um, maybe if we're just looking at individual, maybe we switch to SQLite because maybe our, our data scale has gone beyond what we could store in a CSV and, uh, and using an individual database like SQLite makes far more sense. Or, or maybe we want an enterprise solution like Postgres. Um, and actually the file format or the table structure between all of these is essentially identical. Uh, so, um, once one of them becomes redundant or we need to switch it out, we can just say, well, instead of R writing to CSV, R can write to SQLite or R can write to Postgres. And we keep our table structure pretty much the same. And maybe we need to add in some 
um, some keys and things to link things together, but ultimately we're still looking at that, that tidy data format um, and our normalization, and they, they should be largely the, the same across them. Uh, so then we move on to our analysis, and you know, sort of for our user group, we would hope we'd be using something like R, but equally Python, I mean, things that we can code and check where things have changed and do unit tests, and all those other important things, uh, until ultimately we get through to our, our visualization. Um, so that could be things like Markdown, Shiny, maybe Power BI, all of these things are, uh, and even Excel actually, um, our open database um, consortium compliance, so we can plug them into whatever back end we need uh, and use the, the tools that fit a particular application. Um, but if you remember back to that sort of Excel at the beginning uh, slide, you'll notice Excel doesn't really make an appearance till very, a very long way down the list here, um, or a long way down the workflow that, that we're trying to separate out our, our data store and our analysis or our visualization and rather than it all happening within the same uh, software environment type thing. Um, and as a slight aside, uh, hopefully this GIF's playing nicely. Um, this is a shout out to, uh, to friends and past colleagues at uh, the British Geological Survey who have a tool in Python called ETL Helper. Uh, the, the GitHub link's on there, uh, and that's doing some great work in, uh, in pulling data from um, from places like Oracle and writing to uh, Postgres. Um, so John Stevenson over at the BGS is uh, is heavily involved in this work, and he did a lot of development for Registers of Scotland and uh, and then moved to Postgres. Uh, and back to this uh, data workflow uh, again is that uh, you can see here that actually it sort of doesn't really matter whether our cleaning's in Python or it's in R or whatever else. Actually, what we want is to be able to change and. Uh, and have agnostic links between each part of these flows that we can swap them out as we, we need and require. Uh, and ultimately, this means that, that our work becomes open, transparent, and repeatable. So I guess we often hear in, uh, in academia about open science. Um, in the public sector, we might hear about transparent governance or uh, transparent decisions. Um, but ultimately, what all that comes down to is that our work's repeatable, uh, that our Hopefully, our tools are open and other people can step through and see how we have a re reached a decision or an output um, because they've got um, access to data, provided it's not personal, uh, and access to tools which are you know, hopefully free at the point of use and can say this is exactly, I understand how this has happened. Uh, so now on to sort of the case study here. Uh, so uh, this is a CSSF spending review. Um, so the CSSF uh, finances portfolios around the world, um, I sort of, I don't know, 20 or 30 of them, give or take. And I'm going to be quite vague about a lot of this um, because it was some extremely sensitive data and, um, and I needed to go through quite a lot of clearance to, to work on the project. Um, and the, the spending review data support I provided uh, collated information together and um, visualized spend across uh, sort of places, different parts of the world, uh, different portfolios, different sort of priorities. Uh, and the idea around that was to uh, document and show where the fund was being spent uh, and then use that information to adjust uh, subsequent fund values uh, in following years. So, you know, if it was X amount this year and we reduce it by 10% or we reduce this portfolio by this amount, how does that change our spending priorities? Um, so I came on board uh, about two to three weeks before the first moderation session. Uh, so this is uh, with the, um, I suppose effectively with the, the foreign office. Uh, and uh, that, two to three weeks time was was largely sort of around homework, um, but it ended up being about 12 hours between the final uh, sort of responses from, from the individual portfolios and the, uh, the first moderation session with, um, with senior civil servants saying, this is how we, or let us investigate how the money is spent and what we want to do with it. Um, so we got roughly uh, 30 spreadsheets back, <clears throat> each with around about two sheets in, and within each sheet they had multiple tables. And during the moderation session, these were updated roughly hourly, uh, and the civil servants were expecting back, um, uh, yeah, fairly rapid turnaround updates of visualizations and things, so they could see what the impacts of their uh, spend changes and, and things like that were. 
Um, if you'd like to know more, uh, I've added a link down at the bottom, um, and uh, I think these slides should be available afterwards. Uh, so the trick to solving this problem, because it's obviously quite a rapid turnaround, uh, 12 hours was uh, generating a dummy data set and automation. Um, so my first task was thinking about, well, I've seen the, the template that the portfolios are filling in to submit data. Uh, I can have a pretty good stab at what um, arranging that in a tidy format might be. So let's generate a dummy data set where you know I use R to say let's um, you know generate numbers between X million and another million, uh, and then I could pass that off uh, to to a colleague who is building some fantastic dashboards. Um, and then we could start to try and automate that workflow. So when I uh, got real data in, I could effectively just hit go in R and generate uh, clean CSVs to go off to be ingested into uh, into dashboards. Uh, so in process or in uh, in yeah in the processes is what looked like that I got um, I got spreadsheets back. I downloaded them from from SharePoint. Uh, not my preferred data platform, but it was uh, it had been a long-standing agreement with the client uh, and uh, sort of as I'd mentioned there were a lot of security issues around the data that uh, that I was working on so yeah there were definitely some things that couldn't be moved uh, I read those through R generated uh, clean CSVs some of those or well, they were also read into Power BI for, for some work there um, but they also went off to um, to a colleague who uh, used R to generate uh, some markdown dashboards which the Client could view uh, in sort of whatever web browser or uh, that they they wanted um, as a as an indication of um, security around it. The uh, the dashboards generated by Markdown contain JavaScript, which can't get past the Foreign Office firewall, so they had to uh, be cycled over on CD-ROM um, to to make it into the building and, and get to the client. Uh, so this is a, a dummy data dashboard. Um, you can see there's sort of nothing real in it. it's just sort of department numbers one to sort of whatever 18 20 uh, portfolio numbers uh, one to whatever and then you know it's quite easy to generate within R to say okay you know paste me portfolio comma you know numbers one to whatever um, and this meant the, that my colleague could uh, very easily generate some of these dashboard things and um, hopefully my point is appearing for you. So we've got things like uh, maps in there. We've got networks linking together uh, geographic areas and different portfolio type spends. You know, so we could see which portfolios were most widely spread around the world, or um, or you know, conversely, operating only in uh, in one or two locations. We could you know sort of see um, you know, what maximum spends might be, or, or that sort of thing. Uh, and this meant that. That actually, when that that night came on, that we got our final or you know, got our our returns back from the portfolio, we could very rapidly turn them around, um, ready for the the client to see at sort of nine o'clock on the uh, the following morning. Uh, and if you've not seen them before, they were built in in Flex dashboard. Uh, there's some really great tutorials, as you kind of expect from our studio. Um, some really good examples with code bedded in. Um, you can do sort of storyboards and all sorts of things. They're they're well worth a look. They're absolutely fantastic. Um, but a huge but. Uh, the clients love the dashboards, um, but what they really wanted, as well as that, was they wanted a spreadsheet listing all of their portfolios and to say, well, if we drop the money in this portfolio. What does that look like? They wanted some a tool they were familiar with that they could um, they could poke numbers into and, and ultimately make it back to the dashboards. Uh, so that ended up being being a spreadsheet. Um, so again, this is dummy data uh, uh, generated in R, uh, and this is laid out as per the one that the client was working with. So what they wanted to do was, was go in and say, well, actually, uh, for Portfolio 4, instead of 170 million, maybe we'll only give them 500 million, or yeah, we'll give them 50 million or something in the in subsequent years. Um, what impact does that make? Or um, instead of maybe uh, you know a total amount that they would get, maybe we'll say, well, let's reduce it by 500,000, or let's add on this amount. Um, to, to see how these things would change. Um, and so uh, so our first bit of our code, we're a long way in. Um, 
so this is how I sort of went about generating those dummy columns. Is uh, I said, well, actually, you know, it's fine. Let's uh, just take data at a, maybe a, a million time step up to whatever that huge colossal number is there, 200 million. Um, yes, oh, sorry, 100,000 time step between a million and 200 million, and we'll generate 28 of those. And so you can see sort of how you can very rapidly just be making up imaginary numbers to populate a spreadsheet to to make a dummy data set. Uh, and what does this look like for our um, for our data workflows that we're, we're now going from our, our visualization um, in the dashboard and the clients then entering data in a collection phase again, um, which we're then using automated tools to, to regenerate the dashboard. So we're, we're getting this feedback uh, that the, uh, the client got a tool that they were familiar with and happy playing with, uh, and then we were able to integrate that and uh, flow through back to the, the visualization that they were using for, for their overall, right, what's the impact? If we've toyed with this, what's the impact on, um, on our priority spend or, or all of those other categories they were looking at? Uh, so again, dummy data, uh, and this is what that tidy data format looks like, uh, that we're, um, we're taking out things like our uh, 2021 non-ODA spend where we've got two variables within a column and we're splitting that out so we've now got uh, uh, non-ODA becomes false and there's sort of further on ODA columns that are true uh, and our 2021 is now a, another variable um, and it obviously goes on through 2022 and, and those sorts of things and, and we get our requested uh, value up here um, yeah which thankfully matches the ones we've got on screen fantastic uh, Sabora our code, shock horror. Uh, so well, how did that work in practice? Um, so we went through the, the read Excel function, uh, as, which is part of the tidyverse, uh, possibly, or one of the add-on ones. Um, and we're specifying our sheets. Uh, we're specifying our data range. Uh, for some of the other um, outputs where we had multiple tables within a sheet, we we were making multiple calls and saying, right, let's pull in all of these five tables separately and do different things with them. Uh, turns out if the person entering data at the end changes some of the data formats, particularly say to financial, uh, then Read Excel doesn't see it as a number, it sees it as a date. Uh, so we had to force some um, some data validation effectively uh, to make sure we were getting numbers back. Uh, and then finally, the janitor clean names um, so if we can see here, we've got capitals, we've got uh, non-standard um, variable things going on. So, so using clean names fixes all of that for us and converts it all to, to camel case. Uh, and then we want to go through this normalization step. Uh, if you're not familiar with normalizing data, I've put the Wikipedia link to database normalization, which will be guaranteed to have you sleeping. Uh, rapidly, um, but there are also these other links on here. One of these is the uh, Hadley Wickham Tidy Data paper. Uh, another one is the uh, Broman and Wu paper on data organization spreadsheets, which is also available as a course from Data Carpentry, uh, which I've put a link to there. Uh, so we're going through, we're selecting a subset of some columns. Um, so you see we've got a portfolio name, um, and we've got our, our joint columns of our year and our non ODA or our ODA. Um, that we're renaming, uh, then we're gathering them, which is that normalization step. Uh, although I think it has become pivot longer and I probably should get around to thinking about how that, that differs from gather, but I feel like I've only just worked gather out. So uh, yeah, I don't know, maybe I'll stick with it for another week or two. Uh, finally, or well, next we're uh, splitting out our, um, our columns from, uh, so we get a, a financial year and the odor status and then we're we're tidying up um that if it's odor we call it true and otherwise we call it false uh just to make sort of subsequent uh subsetting of data and filtering that sort of thing easier um and then drop the y from our so our, our y here is part of this y 2021 or, or whatever we'll lose that so we get uh, a numeric back and we'll write that out as a as a tidy csv that um, dashboard colleagues could use and uh, so this is what it then looks like in practice. Okay, fantastic. Um, that we've no longer got a Y on our uh, financial years. We can see we've got true and false. Um, for these, we've also got discretionary in there, which I dropped out of the previous code. Uh, and we've got only numbers back there instead of um, sort of financial uh, information. Uh, so this is then what that looked like in terms of software is we've got this feedback between our dashboard and our, and our spreadsheet again. Uh, 
so um, in summary, uh, we need to understand what the client expectations are, uh, and that should be a, a, a co-creation thing that, um, that often people are asking for dashboards, um, but ultimately they maybe want something that they can play with, so maybe they need a spreadsheet as well. How do we link those things together? Uh, and if we think about that in advance, then when someone desperately asks for a spreadsheet of something, we can give that back in, in hopefully a relatively easy way that doesn't break our whole workflow. Uh, separating out our data workflow makes all of these things easier, and, um, and we can drop out then spreadsheets at sort of any point we need um, to, to hand on to a client, um, but we can swap out for other tools or, or whatever is uh, required. Um, regular data formats make life far, far easier. Um, this idea of automation that once we're, things are re reproducible that we can we can automate them them easier uh, and all of this once this is in place then that this whole idea of anything is possible you know we can we can then get on with some data science or sort of whatever else we're up to um, uh, as I said these slides will be available afterwards I do have one final slide uh, so the uh, the group I was working with are currently um, on the back of the work uh, I and my colleague were doing are now recruiting four data analysts. Um, so this is uh, LTS International, uh, who are based in Pennycook, and Integrity, who are based in London. Uh, and they together form this uh, Gmail, the Global Mail uh, partnership. And they, yeah, they're re recruiting four data analysts. Um, they want to do pilot, a pilot project around improving data in decision making. So it will be a lot of the things I've I've talked about and shown here, and working with tools like R and Python and Power BI. Um, so if you are looking, yeah, for work or whatever, I, I'm like hugely recommend them. A fantastic team of people, uh, and I I thoroughly enjoyed uh, my time there. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mike. Very interesting talk. Um, I'd suggest we keep the question for the end uh, and move on to to Rino immediately. Um, but uh, before before she starts, hi Rino. Um, I, I forgot at the at, at the, the start of the meeting uh, to uh, say we are always on the hunt for other speakers. So if you want to speak to one of our our meetups, just get in touch with either of us through Twitter or mail or any other way, um, and we will arrange a slot for you. Okay. But now let's get on with uh, with Rino. Uh, so many of you know uh, Rino already. She is a data scientist at the Center for Medical Informatics, University of Edinburgh. She is the author of the brand new R for Health Data Science book, which she wrote with her colleague Ewan Aronson. And uh, tonight she'll be telling us all about R for Health Data Science. Good to have you back here, Rino. Thanks so much for having uh, having me. Um, yeah, uh, my talk is all for health data science, but um, don't be, uh, if anyone's not working in health data science, it's very general purpose. We all have health. Uh, a, a little kind of teaser, there were, there's also like penguins and pictures of penguins, because penguins also have health also. Why not? So um, it's definitely not specific to medicine, this talk. I'm just going to show you uh, cool ways how to sh uh, use uh, Shiny apps pretty much. Um, or can I R in general um, at my work. Uh, so this is a an example of the most basic shiny app. It's one I made, so I can shape I can shame it. Uh, but it gets the work done. You know there are variables on the left, and then there's some output um, like a plot and a table on the right. The amazing thing about shiny apps is that they are kind of secured by design. So the person who's interacting with this app. Uh, can only see the plot and the summary table, uh, but they do not have access to the underlying data that is kept on the server side. And this is really useful for health data, which is often sensitive. You know, you want to uh, make your results uh, available for lots of people, but you do, you just cannot give them access to the underlying data sets. So shiny apps are a good use for that. Um, uh, shiny apps are. Um, uh, oh, really good for teaching as well. We use uh, I use them to uh, exemplify statistical concepts because you can you ask button that say make the data not normal, make the data not normal, because gonna you know stuff like that. So they can also work really well for teaching. Um, and and uh, kind of the final point about shiny apps is that even though this is the most basic layout, you can 
uh, you can have, it's familiar, uh, you are absolutely not restricted to this. And if you want, uh, you can um, customize shiny apps. And if you want inspiration on that, there's the annual shiny contest. Um, it runs every January. So if you have a cool shiny app, feel free to submit it. Um, but all equally, just go and have a look at the winners from this year and the previous year. So it's uh, happened twice already. And you can, you'll sure be inspired by all of these amazing shiny apps that you would never have guessed that they're actually shiny apps. So they, they don't have to look like this. Um, now, uh, so shiny apps are quite commonly used for data explorers. They can also have elements of dashboards, so they can be dashboards. Um, there's kind of a lot of overlaps between dashboards and shiny apps. Um, they, uh, they can be used for teaching, makes sense, but how do you use shiny apps in clinical trials? Well, I'm glad you asked. Um, I work at the Royal Infirmary of Edinburgh, although I have been working from home. Uh, since uh, the beginning of it. Um, and one of the clinical trials we, um, we run uh, is uh, one trying to reduce the incidence of wound infection. So, uh, for example, even at the Royal Infirmary, after you have abdominal surgery, any kind of surgery in your belly, uh, and uh, obviously um, uh, it's a very high, kind of high quality hospital with high quality surgeons, uh, still 10% of patients uh, uh, have a wound infection. It's just uh, slightly unavoidable. It's just, um, it just kind of happens, even, even if you are, you know, as clean as possible, and the operating theater is obviously clean as possible. Uh, but what we would could do is, if we diagnose those wound infections, you know, if we realize that the patient was di developing a wound infection post-surgery, as soon as possible, we might be able to uh, treat it more efficiently, or, you know, get, uh, get some antibiotics in there, or kind of other, other kinds of things before it gets too bad. Uh, so one of the clinical trials called the TWIST trial, and there's a reference to a paper and my colleague who's leading it, uh, we, um, it's consented patients, so um, we ask patients, would you like to take part in this trial? Would you like us send us, send us, would you like to send us photos of your wounds? So what happens if they want to take part in this trial after they get discharged uh, from the hospital? They um, go home and use their smartphone to take little selfies of their wounds uh, and then upload them uh, to our research database. Uh, at the moment, uh, how the trial works that is that a clinician then takes a look at that photo um, uh, and then uses a shiny app, so that's in the middle of the slide, uh, to send a text message back to the patient that says, that looks fine, no concerns, but if you're in pain, come, you know, go see a doctor, or, you know, that looks a little bit bad, go show it to your GP, or that is definitely a wound infection about to start or already starting, come back to the hospital. Now, this doesn't replace any existing care. What normally happens after you get discharged from hospital, uh, you just go home and you, you may be invited to come back for a follow-up at some fixed point of time, or you, um, or you might be told, you, you know, just come back when you have concerns. So this is extra reassurance. This isn't replacing any uh, existing care or anything that's currently happening. Uh, and we've been running this way before COVID, so it's not even uh, motivated by, um, you know, remote uh, e-health and stuff, but it obviously would work with that. And the, the tools for that is we do have a research database uh, software. It is a free software, uh, RedCap, but we also use a lot of our, um, we use our scripts and the Shiny app that's built on top of that, that the clinician can just click on. And then the Shiny app will con connect to the database, look up the person's phone number, send it to Twilio, and then Twilio will fire off the response. Obviously names and all of that have been removed. Uh, so it's uh, kind of, uh, um, anonymized and kind of that, that information is kept separately in a separate database. Um, and and the, the app, the Shiny app that does this, upda it updates database, uh, kind of uh, updates responses, sends uh, text messages, is 300 lines of R code. Um, so just to give you an idea of how powerful Shiny can be, you don't need to hire an IT company or IT consultants, a front-end developer, back-end developer. You, um, you can use existing open source tools and um, you know, a couple of hundred lines of code um, uh, to run uh, like a digital intervention. Another way we use Shiny apps uh, at the hospital, oh, 
in research or um, clinical research is to help us manage global uh, data collection studies. Uh, we um, here at Edinburgh uh, run global studies where, um, for example, this is one of our studies, uh, we had collaborators from 80 countries, uh, 400 hospitals and 3,000 surgeons. So surgeons around these, um, you know, from these countries were entering patient data into our database here in Edinburgh. Again, anonymized, but still it is patient data presented by surgeons. So, to, uh, so it's uh, really high quality. So you get all the variables, you know, exactly as it happened in the operating theater, as opposed to um, you know, by the time these data sets get reported to the hospital administration, who reported to the local council, who reported to the country, who then reported to the maybe World Health Organization, there's obviously a lot of aggregation happening and stuff like that. So we, our studies kind of um, complement uh, those kind of administrative, big administrative data sets with really kind of grassroots direct from surgeons, straight from operating theatres, pretty much data sets that we can then analyse and um, kind of uh, publish uh, papers on that will give us useful insights into patient care around the world and what can we do better. So when shiny apps come in, is uh, kind of very much similar to what um, Mike was showing you before, like dashboard, 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 everywhere. So this one is is actually more than a dashboard. It's a shiny app, so it also does things. Uh, it also uh, some of the tabs. Well, you, I'm only showing you one tab. So this shows the data quality and the, the type of data. Um, like a one example, random hospital. Um, yeah, example test hospital has entered, but I can use some of the other tabs to assign hospital leads or um, check if the independent validator has been assigned or done their job. So, um, and this whole shiny app that manages this big project, and again, it works on top of an existing database uh, software, Redcap. Um, the Shiny app doesn't do data collection. You shouldn't be using Shiny apps for data collection. There are tools for data collection. Anyway, to manage how data collection is done, who's entering what, who, which surgeons have completed their data, which haven't. This whole Shiny app for this whole project is 1,000 lines of R code. So again, completely doable by one or two people. Don't need a huge team or a company to do it. And um, so this can be really a really powerful way. Now, I mentioned lines of code twice now, um, and some of you might have kind of wiggled and then seeds a bit, like lines of code doesn't matter. Of course it doesn't matter. And the, here's an example um, of, of, I'm a huge fan of the, not only the Tidyverse, but the pipe operator. I'm loading the penguins data set because I just love it and they're cute. And for example, um, if you, you, you take the penguins and pipe them into a filter, you're selecting a single hospital. And I'll show you some of this code on the next slide as well. You drop missing values because you've decided to do that, but you've checked uh, and it is appropriate to drop them. And then you want to do some um, analysis by sex. Uh, and you take the maximum values for each sex and select the uh, columns you're interested in. So you ended up end up with three columns and the maximum flipper length, hmm, cute, um, uh, for the um, for female and male penguins. You could do the exact same thing using the exact same tidyverse functions on a single line. Yeah, I'll cut it on two just to fit it on the slide. But you could do it on a single line. So obviously. Uh, and that's not useful, that's not good, it's harder to read the second example, uh, it's harder for yourself to understand it, harder to debug, so don't ever go kind of optimizing the number of lines um, just for the sake of it. However, the reason I did mention the number of lines is just to give you a rough idea of the workload, because obviously there are scripts, or there might be shiny apps that are uh, tens of thousands of lines, uh, but you can actually get a lot done with not that much um, R code, so I'd encourage anyone to look into Shiny if you haven't already. Um, and two um, cool tips that I'm, I'm only <laughs> too late to discover recently, I'm not going to tell you how recently, uh, slice max. So slice is a tidyverse function that uh, just selects a number of rows. I often, well sometimes if you want to um, uh, have a 
to head, for example, a base R head function uh, displays the first six uh, rows of a data set. But the good thing about slice is that it respects group by. So if you group by a variable and then you slice one or slice one to three, you will get the first three uh, observations of each group. So you can quickly check that your data kind of looks okay, that it's ready and okay, all the groups exist. But the really cool thing about uh, uh, slice is that it also has companions called slice max and slice min. Uh, so it, previously I would have used the filter to say, you know, penguins group by sex and then filter flipper length double equals the maximum flipper length. And that would have given me a table that retains the maximum values for uh, flipper lengths for each sex. However, slice max will do that automatically and it will do it better because you can uh, specify how, how many max so you can get the three uh, highest values uh, and you can uh, uh, specify what to do with ties. Do you want to just grab the first one or do you want to include the tie so you might end up with four values if you know there are two equal flipper lengths. So yeah, slice and group by work well together. Slice max and group by work well together. The other one that I was too late to discover uh, is drop NA, because again, previously I would have done filter, not equals NA sex. Uh, the exact same thing can be achieved with penguins um, pasted, um, piped into drop NA sex. So it will drop all the uh, rows from that data set where sex is missing. So, you, uh, But other other variables could still be missing or you know, you could, you, you could specify multiple if you want to. So there's, there's a lot of data uh, being uh, kind of generated uh, at the hospital. Uh, so the Edinburgh Royal Infirmary has 900 beds and they're usually 90% full, even again, pre-COVID. <laughs> Uh, there's a lot of data to be looked at. They, um, there'll never be enough just pure statisticians and data scientists to look at it. Uh, other people, uh, other medical researchers, uh, or, or even clinicians uh, who want to do kind of data-driven research have to acquire a kind of basic data skills and kind of some basic cleaning, some basic plotting, because otherwise uh, we'll never get anywhere with the, the data is just going to be collected and be sitting on databases. Um, so, um, I would like to reassure anyone uh, who's working in wh whether with health data or in other domains where you feel like you, you're not a statistician or you're not a computer scientist, should I be doing R? Well, uh, well, you do not need to be a mechanic to drive a car, right? You only need a driving license. And similarly, you don't need to be a statistician to do some R, to do some cleaning, some plotting, some basic analysis, right? So there are different levels kind of uses or, and equally, you do not need to be a computer scientist um, uh, to write shiny apps. So they are web apps, they are kind of, really cool they can be really comprehensive uh, and you do not need to be a computer scientist for it how cool and uh, our team so i am i am a data scientist uh, but our team uh, mostly consists of surgeons uh, so people who have a medical degree and who are kind of doing uh, clinical practice at the same hospital I showed you, uh, but they also code. Uh, and we have um, obviously most of our repositories are uh, private um, um, but we do have quite a few uh, public repositories as well. You can have a look. Uh, we've developed several packages, all obviously uh, available. The Healthy R book that uh, Federico kindly mentioned is also freely available. So, but if you if you like, uh, please get a physical copy. But it, uh, you can also have a look at the freely available, fully freely available electronic version, um, which you can find from. <laughs> by Googling it or from our GitHub repositories. We also have a cookbook uh, which has, has like little snippets and hints. Now, the second point um, uh, uh, <laughs> related to cars uh, um, uh, I'd like to make is that you don't get good brakes on your car uh, to go slowly. Your car has good brakes so you can go fast, right? Um, if you re drive really, really slowly, you probably hardly ever need brakes. You can just 
take a, you know, the car will probably stop on its own on a slope or whatever. So yeah, the racing car, fast going cars actually stop much better and have really good brakes. And there's an equivalent of that in R. If you want to go fast in R, you know, if you want to do multiple different analyses, or if you want to rerun the same analysis multiple times on an updated data set or something, you need to write tests. And, uh, and I'm going to give you an example of possibly the simplest way to write an R test, and it works, and this uh, simple way will save you, uh, will get you uh, through a lot already. So the example I'm showing you, what if, um, so this is the example, data set, just uh, three, uh, I'm using slice again, I do love slice, uh, just the first three uh, rows of the penguin data set. Um, uh, so there are three flipper lengths, and your um, the request is, or the analysis is, or your colleague comes to you, oh, Reno, I know you can use R and filters really well. Could you give me, could you just split the data set in half? Uh, so the one, uh, the first half includes uh, all penguins with a flipper uh, length um, smaller than 190 millimeters, and the other data set that includes penguins uh, with flipper lengths uh, greater than 190. Yeah, and I'm like, yeah, I can do that. I'm, all, I'm even like, um, I'm even experienced enough to remember that you probably want to use greater than and equals to on one of them, other, otherwise the exactly 190 will be left out. So I'm like, yep, less than or greater than or equals to. And then I double check the two data sets. I open them up. I'm like, yep, first one has two rows. Second one has uh, one row. It adds up to three rows, which was the original data set. And I'm, I'm quite confident. Uh, I've done the split OK. Uh, I'm going to send it off. And my colleague's like, great, thanks very much. Um, uh, now, a few months pass, and colleague comes back to me. Oh, you did that so quickly. And I bet you have the script saved up, so you, could you split this data set now? And I split it again, and and uh, Bob, I'm a diligent person, so instead of just uh, sending it off to, again, even though it worked the first uh, first time, I check again, oh, it's data set one, two rows, data set two, one row. Oh, but the input had four rows. I missed one, what's happening? Um, so what I forgot to add, uh, well, what I forgot to deal with, the missing values, because uh, missing values are neither less than 190, nor are they greater than 190, so they just get neglected. But there might be other values in the data set that you didn't want to, um, you know, discard. So I check back with my colleague who confirms, oh, yeah, yeah, please include missing values in the smaller data set, uh, just so I know where they are, or, you know, and they're like, okay, I'll do that, I'll do that. But, do you know, I had to go through the, um, uh, in this setup, I had to go through the two data sets again, I had to have a look at them in the environment tab, or I had to kind of, you know, it is a mind, <laughs> some simple mass, two plus one, whatever. But I could have gone faster with a test, and a test in R can be as simple as stop if not. It's a base R function. And if the first time I, I wrote that script, I've added in that one line that says stop if not, end row data set plus one, end row data set, uh, end row data set one plus end row data set two, double equals end row data set, so the original data set. Uh, the first time, this line wouldn't have done anything. It would have just run and quietly, you wouldn't have noticed it was there. But the second time, it would have thrown an error. So instead of me, looking at the environment, pulling up the kind of, you know, checking through the script again, I, I would have just pff, run all and oh, I get an error in your head. Oh, I get too many errors every day. Believe me, I get lots of errors every day from all. Um, um, but the ones I've created, like this one, you know, the, with stop if not or other tests, um, I really like because I usually know where they're coming from and I usually know why I added them in. So this way I could have run, rerun the script on that um, on a new data set much faster and I would have been confident that if there are issues, my own errors my, uh, that are, or my own kind of tests would have notified me. And you can get a lot done with stop if not. Obviously, you can put a lot more things into it than end row. Another thing I often check is unique. You might, if they are, if there are IDs in the two data sets, you might want to check that the unique IDs are in both of them are still included. 
everything is included because obviously you could you get, get you could get a false po positive with here if you accidentally removed some patients and duplicated others but but yeah so you can put pretty much whatever you want in your stop if not uh, there's also an R package called Testa that has loads more functions that are a lot more um, kind of cleverer than that. You can uh, you can add tests to uh, plots as well or tables. So it, yeah, but this is uh, you can actually get a lot done with this kind of stop if not and row stuff thing already, and you can already improve your own confidence in your own scripts, and then you can go faster because you can break. This will break for you. Um, and before I conclude, I'd like to um, mention, most of you probably know most of these things, but I'll mention the kind of different aspects of the R community anyway. Uh, if you're on Twitter, then the hashtag is hashtag RStats. It's really cool. That's where I get most of my new, um, new knowledge uh, or new kind of tips about functions. It's really quite friendly as well. Uh, people often actually post questions on uh, Twitter with the hashtag RStats uh, and you can get like other people solving your problems. Uh, the community.rstudio.com is a, as a site very similar to Stack Overflow. Um, the benefit is that because it's R Studio kind of driven and tidyverse and new, you get like uh, the responses are much new and you get the latest tidyverse functions. Whereas in Stack Overflow, um, often the top uh, top responses from say ten years ago and then it's kind of base R and you have to scroll to the very bottom to see that someone that said, by the way, I also have a tidyverse solution for that. Um, uh, so the community .com might be an easier way to look at tidyverse solutions. Uh, there are at least two Slack communities which are kind of which uh, you're free to join, uh, where you can also ask questions. You can ask anything. No one's ever gonna say this question has been asked a thousand times. No, they'll just answer it again. If you are a woman or uh, of any any identify of any other gender minority. Uh, you're welcome to join the R Lady Slack group, um, um, or you can join the R for Data Science Learners Slack group. I think they're quite equally nice. I'm actually on both, um, and you can find kind of links for joining online. Uh, and uh, Bookdown.org uh, lists uh, a lot, a lot of these books that are freely available, including ours. So you can find resources from there as well. Uh, so in conclusion. Um, everyone should be, everyone who wants to do R should feel empowered to do so because there's so much data. We just, we need, just need all, all hands on deck any, uh, uh, to have a look at data to help with cleaning, help with some basic plotting and more once you get into it. Um, the R community is really strong. Uh, there are, in addition to free resources, there are these um, um, groups uh, or like chat, uh, Slack is team chat uh, if you don't happen to use it already these three uh, so you can join there and to go fast you know to reuse your scripts multiple times or reuse the same code multiple times make sure you can break and you can do that by uh, writing in tests so thank you very much for listening and I think Mike and I are jointly taking questions so how does this work <laughs> well, thank you very much Rinu very nice talk, as always. Um, so uh, we will take uh, questions for the speakers uh, from, from the audience. We, you can, you can speak. Are we keep recording for questions? Um, are we keeping the recording of questions, or do you want to do your closing notes and then go to questions? Um, I think I think I'll do the closing notes and then we close the recording. Um, so so uh, so yeah, not not much of closing notes actually. So just to thank our speakers uh, for those that will see this recording, and uh, remember we're always on the lookout for new speakers. Thank you very much.